Good morning and welcome to Trendside Online Church. I'm Cade. I'm Eve. I'm Prayer. I'm Freeman. You might not know me, but you might know my parents, Stephen Becca Scott. Please listen as we read this passage from Psalm 138. I give you thanks, O Lord, with all my heart. I will sing your praises and bow down before you as I worship. I will praise you for your unfailing love and faithfulness. Your promises are backed by the honor of your name. As soon as I pray, you answer me. You encourage me by giving me strength. Though I am surrounded by troubles, you will protect me. Reach out, you reach out your hand, and the power of your right hand saves me. I will sing about the Lord's ways, for the glory of the Lord is very great. The Lord will work out his plans for my life, for his faithful love endures forever. O oh Lord, I give you thanks with all my heart. Let's begin our worship with Sing Wherever I Go.
my eyes so I may see that you have made these ways for me. Open up my eyes so I may see that you, my God, will walk with me. Open up my eyes. Good morning, Trentside. I'm so glad that you've joined with us this morning. Just a few things for you to note this morning in terms of announcements. A big thank you, first of all, to all you members who have sent in your ballots for our correspondence business meeting that we're doing. We are just waiting on the final votes to come in by mail, and then we will announce the results next week. Also, a reminder about our youth ministry. The summer youth program has started this past Friday. And if you want to be part of what is happening or parents, you want your youth to get connected, make sure you're on Pastor Ryan's email and communications list for what's coming up in the coming weeks. You can also look at the church's website for more information as well. Would you bow your heads with me as we come before the Lord in a time of prayer this morning? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks with our whole hearts this morning, and we sing your praises gladly. We praise you, Lord, because you alone show us steadfast love that never wavers and faithfulness that can be fully relied upon. Nothing in heaven or on earth begins to compare with you. Thank you for giving us your word. Thank you that in it we can learn the truth of who you are and what you've done and of who we are and what we are called to do. Please show us the ways that we can, in our world today, show love to the unwanted, the mistreated, and the helpless, just as you have shown sacrificial love towards us when we were helpless in our sin. God, remove our pride and remind us that every good in us, every truth that we understand is only by your grace. Cause us, your church, to be known as a people who are compassionate and humble and willing to help even at great cost to those who are in need. And God, we pray that at this time also that you would speak to us through your scriptures. Be with Pastor Dave as he challenges us from your word this morning. Help us to put any distractions aside. And God, we pray for this pandemic. Lord, we pray that it would come to an end, that a vaccine would be found. We also pray this morning for those who are dealing with sickness in our midst or who are waiting for operations, God. May your hand be upon them. Lord, we also continue to pray for our country's leaders. We pray that you would give them wisdom. May they look to you for help during these times. We pray all this in the, in the great name of Jesus. Amen. You know, summer in the Korth is, is special. There's just something great about living here. There's so much to see, so much to do. And one of those things is the joy of sitting by a campfire with family and friends, laughing, roasting marshmallows, and telling stories. And so as we enter into the summer here at Trentside, we are beginning a new series with the theme of campfire stories. The Bible is the Word of God. And so we call that special revelation. It's a collection of books written by many different authors over many, many years. And in it, we find a number of different types or genres of writings. There's poetry, which includes the Proverbs and Psalms and the wisdom books, prose, discourse, letters, epistles, essays. But the style of writing that makes up most of the Bible is narrative, stories. 
Well, just think about Jesus' ministry and his teaching. He told stories, we call them parables, in order that the hearers would understand. And this makes sense to us now because it's clear that humanity is hardwired for story. Just look at the great novels of the past or the epic films of the present. They all follow a similar story cycle. Why is it that you can tell that a story doesn't end quite right? Or you can tell when a story really hits home? We are a people that love a good story. Just think about your favorite crime drama. In the span of one hour or less, the writer and actors take you on a journey through the same old cycle. It might open with a couple walking down a path at night, holding hands, enjoying some conversation, and then it happens. They come upon a dead body. The tension, the point, the point of the story has been revealed. And for the next half hour to 45 minutes, the detectives or police or whoever will be looking for clues as to who this is and how they happen to be here in this state. And you know that the suspect they have after 20 minutes is not the killer. With about seven to 10 minutes left, the killer is revealed. There is closure to the tension. And then we return to a happy scene, almost a sigh of relief. Now, I'm sorry if I just ruined every show for you, but it's true. They all follow the same basic pattern from perfection to tension, to increasing problems, to major crisis, and then to a surprising twist or the release of the tension and then back to perfection. So we're going to dive into some of the best love stories of the Bible, and I hope that we can see these beautiful stories in new ways, remembering always that they are part of our Bible. And when we say story, we don't mean fable. So go ahead, grab a camp chair and some marshmallows, sit back, and let yourself be immersed in the stories of the Bible. Have you noticed that you have a bias? We all do. It's everywhere we look. It's because of the articles and videos we watch or the social media feeds we have. They give us more of what we're already interested in. It can feel like everyone else holds the same view as you. This is something called confirmation bias. It's in your social media, your choice of news channel, the newspaper you read, the friends you hang around with, maybe even the political party that you subscribe to. This is what makes it so easy to see the wrong in others, but to excuse or rationalize it in ourselves. And, and I'm not immune to that. Now in setting the scene for the story I want to look at today, we see this confirmation bias in the Jews of Jesus' day. It's winter in Jerusalem, and Jesus finds himself in Solomon's colonnade. He's here for the festival of dedication, or as we might call it, Hanukkah. And while he's there, some Jews ask him what seems to be a harmless question. It even sounds like an honest question. John 10, 24, the Jews were there gathered around him saying, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. This harmless question actually belies their ulterior motives. And Jesus engages in dialogue with them and he uses their own religion against them. He answers them, I did tell you. But you do not believe. The works I do in my Father's name testify about me. And at this point, the questioning Jews bend down and pick up stones intent on using them on Jesus. But Jesus said to them, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of these do you stone me? And they answer him that it's not for his good works, but it's for blasphemy. You, a mere man, claim to be God. And Jesus responds to them, and, and then he's able to escape to get away. You see, the Jews tried to accuse and convict and execute Jesus for the crime of blasphemy. And yet he's able to get away. They didn't believe, even though the evidence was right in front of their eyes. Their confirmation bias, also known as my side bias, was blinding them. And Jesus' claims and works hit at the man-made foundations of their Jewish religion. This scene sets the stage of the hatred, the unbelief of the Jews toward Jesus. And after Jesus and the disciples leave Jerusalem, they decide to return to where John the Baptist had been baptizing. The people there welcomed him due to the things that John had said about Jesus. 
There's no point sticking around in Jerusalem where the people don't want to hear or don't want to believe the truth. And so while they're here, a message comes to Jesus that his dear friend Lazarus is sick. And now you have to understand that to send that message was no small task. They didn't pull out their phone and send a text message. The message alone should have been a clue that this illness was serious. Jesus, you need to come and heal our brother. That's what a friend and Messiah would do, isn't it? To go to his dear friend, heal him so that he doesn't die. But here it is. Lazarus is dying. But Jesus intentionally waits. John eleven six. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. It's beginning to look a little like Jesus is either betraying his friends or, or he can't do what they want him to do. It seems a little uncaring and cold, almost apathetic towards these close friends. Why would Jesus do this? Now, we all know people who are all talk, but when the opportunity arises to actually do what they say they can do, they backtrack. They find reasons why they can't do it. Jesus seems like one of these people here. He's waiting. He's putting off. What would his friends have been thinking? I thought he loved us. I thought he was the Messiah. We've seen him heal people right in front of our eyes. So why isn't he coming to our rescue? It must have been difficult for Mary and Martha in particular. They must have been asking, why would Jesus do this? Well, after a couple of days, Jesus tells his disciples that the time had come for them to go to Bethany. Verse 11, after he had said this, he went on to tell them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to wake him up. To which the disciples thought he was being literal and figured that if he slept, he would just get better. But Jesus clears this up for them. He told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Jesus the one who has been traveling around teaching from the scriptures, claiming to be the long-awaited Messiah, the healer of various diseases and ailments, chose not to save the life of his own dear friend. Why would Jesus do this? Finally, Jesus and his disciples head to Bethany. When they arrive, Lazarus has been in the tomb for four days. And Mary and Martha had many friends who had arrived already, and they went to mourn the death of Lazarus. And as Jesus and his disciples come into town, they're met by Martha. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. See, Martha knew that Jesus could have prevented Lazarus' death. In her mind, that was it. When Lazarus died, he was gone. And the same happens when Mary greets Jesus. She reached Jesus. She reached the place where Jesus was and saw him. She fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And when Jesus saw her weeping and, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him, he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. And Jesus wept. Jesus finally goes to his distraught friends. And he mourns Lazarus' death. And he mourns the unbelief of Mary and Martha, who knew that Jesus could have prevented Lazarus from dying. And yet there they were, left wondering, why would Jesus do this? See, the arrival of Jesus doesn't release any tension or emotion. It doesn't relieve the grief of Mary and Martha. It just raises accusations. The dead brother is still dead. Mary and Martha have doubts. Why would Jesus do this? Jesus is stalling. He waited more than four days to go in the first place. He could have prevented Lazarus' death, as had been previously witnessed. And yet here he is, visibly and deeply moved weeping. But did he really love this family? It was not just that the family believed that he could have prevented the death of Lazarus, but others as well. What would this lack of action do to the notoriety he had built up in his ministry so far? 
People had begun following their Messiah, the one who would remove the Roman oppression, the one who would sit on David's throne. Well, what would Jesus do? When they arrive at the tomb, Jesus simply asks for the stone to be rolled away. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been there four days. Jesus has the stone removed and Martha still doesn't get it. All she can think of is that it stinks in the tomb. Why is Jesus doing this? That's the question, it seems, that everyone in this story is asking. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't add up. And yet, Jesus had a plan. He's not aloof. He is not apathetic. There is a purpose to his tardiness. He responds to Martha. Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? I could just see her there. Huh? I, I did believe. But you didn't do your part. You didn't come and heal my brother. So they took away the stone. And then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. Jesus prays to the Father in order to show their oneness. He's praying to the one that the Jews revered. And in their minds, he's blaspheming yet again. But you see what he's doing? He's praying to the Father for a purpose, for their benefit. For what? That they may believe that you sent me. And when he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out. His hands and his feet were wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Jesus' words remind the people of who he, who he has said that he is. And then he uses his power to raise the dead. Mary, Martha, the disciples, everyone else who was there knew that Jesus could heal Lazarus from his illness. But they had no category in their mind for him to bring him back to life. And yet here he is. The dead brother, Lazarus, is alive. And Jesus goes to the tomb and he does the unthinkable and the impossible as a means of showing that he is doing the works of his father who sent him. And now I've asked again and again today, why would Jesus do that? And the answer is simple. It's so that you might believe. Think about it. What if Jesus had come right away? He could have healed Lazarus, which would have been amazing in itself. Why did he wait so long to go to his friend Lazarus? Well, see, skeptics have tried to discredit any and all miracles. They're just optical illusions. It's a, a fake illness. It's a setup. He's only really healed. No, but see, Lazarus was dead. Four days dead. Not faked. Not possible. Only God can do this. This is proof that he is who he said he is. The raising of Lazarus, the disciples believed, and many others believed. And what about you? Do you believe that Jesus is who he said he is? The journey of faith can only really begin when you set aside your confirmation bias and see the glory of God for what it is. And Jesus is the only one who can set you free from the bondage of your sin. See, in a short while after this story, Jesus found himself dying. Not from an illness, but from the cruel execution of crucifixion. There was no one else who could take his place. There was no one who could save him from the authorities except himself. And yet he chose to remain on that cross because he knew full well what it meant. It meant the forgiveness of sins for all people. If only they might believe in him. He died. And he was put into a tomb much like Lazarus. The stone was rolled in front, sealing it. But on the third day, that stone was rolled away, just like Lazarus's. And out he walked, victorious over death and sin and hell. Why did Jesus do that? That you might believe. 
Jesus called Lazarus out of the grave. He calls us to away from our sin and into freedom. Let's sing about it together. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb till I met you. I was breathing, but not. Thanks, Pastor Dave, for sharing from God's Word with us this morning. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all as you go this morning. Thank you for joining us again. And may you today know the joy and the love of our Lord. We'll see you next week. I was breathing but not alive.
Exactly.